The crushing brutality of the cross gave way to dumbfounding bewilderment. Jesus was dead. Then, three days later, he showed up. After Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit poured out on the early church and began his journey across the oceans and across the millennia to collide with you as you sit in this room today. The gospel crossed mountains. The gospel crossed cultures. The gospel crossed hills, valleys, and what you do when you leave this theater carries the story further. The book of Acts began on the other side of the mountains to our east. It continues in your heart, and its next chapter begins on the sidewalk outside. This is the book of Acts. We are spending this year focusing primarily on, of course, always sharing the gospel each week, but equipping Christians to share your faith. And so we went verse by verse to the gospel of John, the gospel that is written specifically to show Gentiles, that is non-Jewish people, that Jesus is the son of God. And then we've chose, chosen the book of Acts to follow that because I wanted you to see what your God is capable of, Christian. And by the way, isn't it amazing? It's incredible. You can see history sculpted by the sovereign intervention of God through his people. History was broken in half by the gospel's introduction, the birth of the church. We literally count whatever year it is based on an historical event's proximity to the birth of Jesus. Everything that came before Christ we call BC or now before the Christian era, the before the common era, BCE. They try to take Christ out of it. You know what you're counting from, skeptic. You know exactly where that countdown started. And everything that happened since we call Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, or after death, or however you want to call it, whatever, even if they're trying to take Christ out of it, we all know that these are the events that broke history in half. The establishment of the Gregorian calendar called year one, there's no year zero on the Gregorian calendar, called year one the birth of Christ and everything ever since. Now we just started history over again. I wanted to show the Redemption Church the perfect gospel to walk through with your friend who's far from Christ. It's amazing. I've seen God use the gospel of John to convert the most militant of atheists in my life, one of whom gave his life to Christ six words in the gospel of John. And I wanted a church to see what God could do. Because if we're praying for revival in the least churched area of the U.S., that's a pretty audacious prayer. It takes some modicum of audacity to pray something like that. And it can make you nervous, especially if you don't know exactly how the church grows, how this works. Historically, here's how it works. God moves. It can't be contrived. It can't be faked. Even if you could fake it, you ought not. It is the movement of God upon his people. And it's not up to you to twist someone's arm. It's not up to you to connive. It's not up to you to contrive. It's not up to you to really convince. Rather, you just share the gospel. You share the gospel. You share the gospel. The Holy Spirit moves on people's hearts. This is what happens. History gets broken in half. That's why I wanted you to see the book of Acts. I've got something kind of cool to share with you too. All of the Bible studies that I wrote for the gospel of John are now available in print. We praise God for that. So what's so cool about it is that as God continues to do beautiful things through the Redemption Church, which, which just blesses my soul, I want us to be able to take what we have here and I want us to be able to share it with other churches. All right, I want, us to, I want us to see God do the same thing in other churches and other areas. I want to see revival spring up and I don't want it to just come from the Redemption Church. Is it okay for me to pray that God brings revival through every church in this area that is faithful to teach Jesus as Lord? Absolutely. And so I want us to be able to share the resources that, that we're producing. So man, praise God for that. Acts is coming next. And as we move forward, the farther we get into this, the more I can get ahead of where I'm preaching, I'll be able to provide print resources for, for you guys as small group leaders. All right. So bear with me, pray for me. God's on the move. This is really cool. We're going to wrap up the book of Acts. And next week, we're going to begin a six-week series in apologetics. And followed, we're going to follow that with a series in evangelism training. And then after that, I know this isn't, this isn't the kind of headlining stuff that sounds really attractional in nature. <laughs> Ooh, the doctrine of communion. But that's what we're doing because this is the foundational teaching for the church. Because you fast forward years from now, when you see your coworker come to Christ, who's been a non-believer his entire life, 
and has no idea that there are two testaments in the Bible. Everything is just starting totally from, from ground zero, starting totally from scratch. Like, what resource can you give them? This is why I wrote the book for new believers as well. So I've given you something to give to your friends who become Christians. Also, this year's worth of teaching, John, Acts, apologetics, evangelism, the doctrine of baptism, the doctrine of communion, all of this is foundational so that when somebody gets saved five years from now at the Redemption Church, you have all the teachings that you need to be able to disciple them and catch them up. Go back through this series with them, and now they are equipped to share their faith, faith through the Gospel of John and through evangelism training and through apologetics training. They are able to see what our God is capable of in the book of Acts. The last time that I arranged a systematic theology teaching plan like this, the ministry that I was over quadrupled. And I've seen more growth already come at this point in the teaching than I did last time. So do you think God might be up to something here with his word? It's almost as though the word of God is inspired or something. I've had six conversations this week with members of the Redemption Church who were like, I just shared my faith for the first time. That excites me so tremendously because that's where the church growth happens. It doesn't happen like this. Hey, come to this church with me and then and watch this guy talk. <laughs> that's, that's not church growth. All right? it's, not, it's not really up to me to grow the church. Are you ready for this? It's up to you. <laughs> you sharing the gospel with your coworkers, with your friends, you inviting people in your life to come meet Jesus. That's how church growth happens. That's how church growth happens. Okay. I invited somebody yesterday. She's not likely to come. All right, but you can do the same. And if we all team up on this, if we, if we have only have one person who's really growing the church, then we grow, you know, we have one growth factor. But if all of us reach out, if every one of us leads just one person to Christ in one year's time, the entire church doubles in size. And moreover, if you equip that person to then share their faith with someone else, you grow by multiplication, not on an X equals Y diagonal line, but an X equals Y squared parabolic curve. This is how the church was born. So it's not even a new idea. This isn't some sort of church growth strategy. This is just what happens when you hold out the word of God and you believe that it's true and you enact it. John said, these things have been written so that you would believe and by believing have life in his name. So we teach the gospel of John. Luke wrote a letter to a man named Theophilus, his second. His first letter was the gospel of Luke. Acts is his second letter to provide an extensive account of what happened here and to see how God is the one who grows his church. God is the one who brings the church growth. It's a miracle of the Holy Spirit every time he says Jesus is Lord. So all we're doing is just going through the word of God, and we're going to go through every book of this together. Every year, we have designed, I, I learned a lot when I was over uh, Explore the Bible, the expository curriculum for life with Christian resources. And I had a lot of changes that I, I, I kind of wanted to make. God blessed it. It grew. It became the best-selling adult Bible study in the world. But I, had, I still had more ideas. I still had more things I wanted to change. But it was so entrenched in tradition, and it was so linked to a business model that I, I didn't have a whole lot of flexibility. Well, uh, here comes the, the Redemption Church. <laughs> And, and it, it's accompanying ministry that produces these resources. And so I had a blank slate, a tabula rasa. This is what I propose. We go through every book of the Bible. We go to a gospel every year, every fall. About this time, we're going to go to a gospel. And you're going to hear about Jesus. Everything comes to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. Even while we're studying doctrine in the beginning of the year, we're studying historical books in the summertime. They're all going to point to Jesus, point to Jesus, point to Jesus. Let's go to Acts chapter 28. This week, you're going to see a combination of this sermon with this week's curriculum, along with this week's devotions. As we finish out the book of Acts this week, you're going to see the final chapter of Acts spread across the week. Here's Acts chapter 28, verse 1. Once safely ashore, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The local people showed us extraordinary kindness. They lit a fire and took us all in since it was raining and cold. As Paul gathered a bundle of brushwood and put it on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the local people saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to one another, this man no doubt is a murderer. Even though he has escaped the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But he shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no harm. 
they expected he would begin to swell up or suddenly drop dead. After they waited a long time and saw nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Paul has been shipwrecked. And initially, they didn't know exactly where they were. They didn't know what island they were on. Malta had a port and still has a port today, where a lot of these guys would have been familiar with it, but they saw it from a totally different angle because they were tossed about in a storm. They had four anchors that they had cut loose from their this, this Alexandrian ship, this Egyptian grain ship. And in the midst of the storm, they cut their anchors away. Today on Malta, there's a maritime museum and it has these four anchors, the, exactly the way that the man who discovered the anchors described the, the, uh, the, 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 lo the location is exactly how Acts 27 describes where the shipwreck took place. So I don't know for sure if these are the exact four anchors from Paul's ship, but tucked away in the corner of the Maritime Museum in Malta is something that says like four Alexandrian anchors. <laughs> and it's exactly where and exactly what we should expect to find based on Paul's account as they have arrived on Malta, remember that Paul is a prisoner. Okay, he is a prisoner. He is under, under guard at all times. As they set sail from Crete, Paul was saying, you shouldn't do this. Everything looked great at first. And they had this gentle south wind spring up. Paul was like the little doomsday sailor. Like something bad is gonna happen. We should not sail here. But in the, in the first few verses, as we saw in last week's curriculum, it looked really great. And then comes the nor'easter, which is this dreadful wind that plagues the Mediterranean anywhere from like October through February every year. It still does this. That wind still exists today. All the nautical terminology described in the book of Acts is like this tour de force of the Bible's historicity and credibility because it still describes fair havens. It still describes Malta. It still describes the nor'easter. It describes sailing practices that are legitimate and sound. And as, as Paul was saying, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this, it, something bad's going to happen. Sure enough, they get blasted and they end up shipwrecked exactly as Paul predicted, now on Malta. All the while, they didn't listen to Paul. And then when they finally find themselves in dire straits, Paul does have the brief, I told you so moment. All right, we talked about this in student ministry. Like every one of us kind of confessed, I'd probably rub in the I told you so a little bit more than Paul did. <laughs> But now he has credibility and they begin to listen to him. God spoke to him. If you remember in the larger context, he already knows that he's going to survive this. He already knows that God has told him he's going to stand before Caesar. Last week, we saw him stand before Herod Agrippa and Festus and Bernice. And even that wasn't the, the, the end game for Paul. He knew that he would stand before Caesar and eventually he would. It would be before Nero, in fact. But for that reason, he wasn't worried personally about the shipwreck. He was warning the crew about what was to come. And because of their proximity to Paul, they were saved. Can you stop for a second, Christian, and think about that? Who in your life is blessed by their proximity to your relationship with Christ? Do you see the parallels that we have with Paul? That we, like Paul, we're on board a ship and we know that there's disaster coming, but we also know that God said that these people could be saved. So Paul predicts it. His guard is won over by Paul. He even has this moment of like a coup where he defies sort of the edict of the rest of the crew and says, no, 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 don't kill your prisoners because he wanted to save Paul's life. They have washed aground on what was initially an unfamiliar beach and the natives, the locals, they all come out and they begin to host these people. You could, you're you're going to meet this guy who is an appointee of the Roman Empire who shows them incredible hospitality. Now remember, based on the previous chapter, there are 276 people on board this ship. That's a party. And as they've gathered everybody together, they, 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 they have a fire built for them. They show them incredible hospitality. And that's a, that's a blessing from... God, but here's, here's the motives. We know that they serve the pagan goddess Justice because they name Justice. They believe that Justice has inflicted this harm upon Paul by, by way of this viper because of something terrible that he had done. They, they, they said, this man is obviously a murderer. 
Now, th that their worldview in showing even hospitality was based in a similar sort of transactional virtue system. They didn't necessarily show hospitality perhaps out of the goodness of their hearts. There were some of these who would show hospitality to strangers just in case the person who showed up was a God who would smite them after the fact. But they would show great hospitality nonetheless. They have an incredible legacy and then there's gonna be a church that's born among these people. We see that Paul washes ashore. He then, this is what's striking to me. It's raining and it's cold. They show that the local people show extraordinary kindness. They build a fire. And then look at verse three with me. Remember, Paul is a prisoner. Paul gathered a bundle of brushwood and put it on the fire. Can we just talk about that for a second? Why is Paul pitching in? He doesn't have to do anything. He's chained for crying out loud. Everything is twice as hard for him as it is for everybody else. <laughs> and he pitches in, I'll help. And he's in, he's in jail. Like if you're in jail, what are you gonna do if you don't cooperate? If you don't help set up the buffet line, what are they gonna do? Arrest you again? But Paul, because of his servant's heart, just begins to chip in. He begins to help. This is amazing. Paul knows where he's going. He knows that his chains won't last forever. He's going to have a second Roman imprisonment after this one that will eventually lead to his death. But during this upcoming imprisonment, he's going to write. He's going to serve. The prison epistles, like the book of Philippians, comes about because of the events of Acts. The book of Acts provides the background for many other books. We've already seen the church at Corinth planted in our series. Paul would later write letters to those churches to correct error, First and Second Corinthians. We, we see the church in Philippi written to during this imprisonment. We see Galatians also comes up. We see the background for the book of Galatians in this dispute among the Judaizers. We see the backdrop for many of the New Testament epistles in the book of Acts. It tells you the story behind the theological letters. And Paul has devoted himself even while imprisoned, even while changed, just serving in some capacity. If, if this, this is incredible. If you're unwilling to serve in the small ways, you're not qualified for leadership. He's devoted himself, even while he's a prisoner, to just serving other people. He is helping build the fire while he's chained up. Moreover, he gets bitten by a viper and then just shakes it off. I will never forget what I saw when I was in college and I was in this group and I was touring and uh, I was auditioning for the group and the director, the head honcho, the whole organization. He had several hundred people all coming to audition to be a part of this group. And he was walking around the facility that they had rented and he was picking up trash. I was, I was so impressed with that. I was so struck by that. I was like, God, if you call me to be in a leadership capacity, let me never forget that. If you're entrusted, if you show yourself trustworthy with small things, God will entrust you with big things. If you show yourself trustworthy with the small things, if you're willing to serve in a small capacity, God will entrust you with more and more. Paul is willing to serve even in a small capacity, even while he is a prisoner. This is, this is a bit counterintuitive, especially if you're brand new to the church world. You get more out of your church experience when you serve, when you pour into it when you have ownership over it, when you are the one who shows up to join the team to pitch in in some way, this is where you experience more of the blessings of church life. It gets you outside of yourself. If, if your preferences aren't being met at a given church, good, show up and serve more. If, if there are things about your church that you see that need to be improved, good, step up. This is where you experience more of the blessedness of church life is when you, like Paul here, just serve. And Paul wasn't even serving in his church. This wasn't a church. These were pagans on an island where he, as a prisoner of Rome, had shipwrecked. And even in that capacity, he began to serve. This guy is well qualified to write the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. This guy is well qualified to write the letter to the church at Corinth, the church in the region of Galatia the church at Philippi, the church at Ephesus. We can see here how even when he is shipwrecked and chained, he's serving. This is where you experience more out of church life. Yeah, but Jesse, what if I don't like the music? You sign up to serve in worship ministries. 
Jesse, what if I don't think the food is very good? Well, then you sign up to become a holy smoker or a food team member. Jesse, what if I think we could do X, Y, or Z better? Then you check boxes X, Y, and Z on the serve card. This is how Paul experienced his own imprisonment. He still saw himself as obligated to serve. And then this viper comes out. To this day, uh, to this day, as of today, there are no venomous vipers on the island of Malta. But there was a massive cull of venomous snakes all around the Mediterranean. This was a huge problem in the first century. Venomous snakes took people out like crazy. And so there was a massive cull of these snakes. Today, they're all gone. And many of the other surrounding areas where we know, based on even extra biblical historical sources, these venomous snakes were a really big problem. They're, they're no longer there. But the, this, this viper comes out of the brush and attaches itself onto Paul's hand. I grew up in Florida. I've seen a lot. Of, I, I didn't even know until, it didn't dawn on me until like last week when another hurricane hit Louisiana and, and, and my hometown of Pensacola caught a lot of the wind and rain. It didn't even dawn on me that I, I thought it was normal to have a life-threatening storm every three years on average. I thought that was just normal. I thought it was normal to see snakes commonly. I mean, I'm, I'm talking especially like during the summertime when it would get hotter, you would see more and more of them. I, I thought that just seeing snakes that could kill you if they bit you one time, I, I thought that that was a normal part of childhood <laughs> and growing up and being able to distinguish when, which ones you could pick up and throw at someone. Since moving to Washington, I've only seen two snakes. And one of them was last week on Tiger Mountain. It was a little bitty guy with these white stripes down its back. I didn't know what it was. That was weird for me too. I, I, can't, I can't name like half the animal species that show up in my yard. Except for the bobcat. I knew what that was. These snakes, they creep everybody out. They creep us out. But Paul has one of these suckers stuck on his hand. And did you see his reaction? Look at verse five. But he shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no harm. Like there's no record of Paul throwing a massive tantrum. There's no record of, of Paul then crying out in the injustice of it all. There's no record of Paul trying to save his reputation or save face. He just literally physically shook it off. All right, in both, in, in both the literal physical sense and in the, the Taylor Swift usage of the term. Shook, shook, shook it off. I've seen a tendency in the church to exist in a state of perpetual woundedness when something bad happens. And this is our way of emulating our culture because the higher you rank on the victim status rubric, the more afflictions you suffer and bad things that happen to you, the more sympathy you are due. And the less is really expected of you and we can then say, wait a minute, hang on. I, I can't serve right now. I can't evangelize right now. I can't share my faith right now. It's not time for that because I just need time to heal. I need time for all the bad stuff to stop happening and for me and my head to be able to move past it and move on. I'm exempt right now from the mission of God because I've just been wounded and I need time to heal. I've seen this particularly in the church in our area. It's more common here where we will stay and sit and perpetually tend to our wounds without ever getting back on mission. My family and I went through some stuff last year and people looked at me and even like stupid bloggers criticized me for actually, you know, trying to reach people for Jesus, having no concept of the idea that like there's healing in the mission. There's healing when you move on. If you want to sit and wait for the bad stuff to stop happening, you're never going to evangelize anybody because that's not stopping until the events of revelation take place. That there's never going to come a time where all is truly well. There's always going to be something. There's always going to be a wound. There's, especially if you're reaching people for Jesus, you're going to have a target on your back. You're going to have a wound in your past. You're going to have something that you're ashamed of that you need the Lord to redeem you of. They're going to have to, you're going to have to endure some form of trauma at some point. The, the state of perpetual woundedness is totally foreign to Paul. 
He is already, by the way, wrongfully imprisoned. Twice, the Jewish authorities have tried to just murder him. They got busted in a sham of a trial. They tried to blame that on Paul, saying he was desecrating the temple, and we arrested him. No, that is nonsense. They were trying to murder Paul, and they got busted by Roman centurions. Now he's in a wrong, in an utter violation of his rights as a Roman, put through these shams of these trials, and so he appeals to Caesar. So he ought not be a prisoner anyway. The, the, very, the very terms of his arrest were falsified, and he's still a prisoner. And then he's on a ship where he told everybody we shouldn't do this. You should not set sail. You're going to wreck. They don't listen to him. They sail. They wreck. Everything goes exactly as Paul predicted. He's been the only right person surrounded by what seems like morons for the last five years of his life. And now he gets bitten by a snake. That might have been the breaking point for me. Like, come on! But Paul literally, and perhaps spiritually, shakes it off. Into the fire, no less. And then just moves on. You could see how there's a conflict of worldviews because the, the, the local inhabitants of Malta see this happen. And they interpret it totally differently than Paul does. And Paul's actually the one in it. They look at him and their, their, uh, their verdict on Paul they, they go straight for the jugular immediately. I mean, wow, like God help you if you get a speeding ticket on Malta. Look, look at what happens. They, they watch him get bitten. And then verse four, when the local people saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to one another, this man no doubt is a murderer. Like without any doubt whatsoever, it is obvious to all of us, this is prima facie, that guy is a murderer. How do you know that? Because there's a snake on his hand. Something bad happened to him. You could see a bit of a parallel between the applied ethics and the worship of the goddess Justice. Okay, if you, if you look in your Bible in, in verse four, you'll see that Justice may be capitalized. At least it ought to be, because in the original Greek manuscripts, it is, because it's, it's a proper noun. It's a name. The name, Justice. You already are familiar with Justice. You've seen her before. She is blindfolded, holding scales. Justice is blind. The personification of the paradigm of justice in the pagan sense was this goddess. And this Greco-Roman understanding of why bad things would happen to people is also parallel to an Eastern understanding known as karma which has kind of come back into, back into fashion at times, where, okay, if something bad has happened to you, then evidently you have done something bad to deserve this. When you couple that in the Eastern sense with the cyclical understanding of time, here in Western cultures, we think of time as just linear, right? There's a beginning and we're just moving this direction. In Eastern cultures, a lot of times it's, it's more cyclical and we're just going around and around and around in a cycle. This is actually parallel to their understanding of reincarnation, where you die and you come back as some other being. And what really stinks about that deal is that if you, in one of these incarnations, in the Eastern sense of cyclical time, if you do something really bad, and then you are reincarnated, even in another life, you could suffer something utterly horrendous that you had nothing to do with. At least, again, this is the pagan understanding of reincarnation in a past life. To be clear, there are no past lives. Reincarnation is not a thing. The Lord created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, and he has already authored how it ends. So a biblical understanding of the nature of time would be linear. See Genesis, see Revelation, and everything there between is what we call time. Now, Paul getting bitten by a viper and then immediately being called a murderer, I think is exhibit A as to why this is fallacious thinking. And if it's not clear enough, I'll tell you about my niece, Elle, three years old, the most precious little girl you've ever seen in your life. You know my baby girl, Autumn Grace, has curly blonde hair. Elle had like twice as much curly blonde hair and a mischievous smile. She called herself Big Girl, my brother's daughter. On my birthday, when she woke up in 2015, she was unresponsive. Three months later, she was gone. She had a brain tumor. 
Now, let's look at this through the lens of karma, or this sort of virtuous transaction system that would, entail, that would be entailed in the worship of the goddess Justice. All right, some would, by that worldview, look at my brother and my sister-in-law, Allie, and, and, and their family and ask, okay, like, what terrible thing did you do to deserve this? That would be the teachings of karma. That would be, that would be like the observation made by someone who worshiped justice. And what it would utterly fail to see as well is, what did L do? And the obvious answer is, absolutely nothing whatsoever at all. The implications of clashing worldviews are tremendous. Because Paul observed the exact same thing. The inhabitants of Malta observed the exact same thing, but they had radically different conclusions. My brother is an elder at his church in Birmingham, Alabama. Okay, they are biblically rock solid, and they have a biblical framework through which to observe this. They understand what God has done. They have a trust in the sovereignty of God, and they have faith in his ever-redemptive plan. Now, someone from the outside looking in through a karma worldview, through a worship of justice worldview, would now think ill of my brother, my sister-in-law, my niece, L, because obviously if something bad happened to you, then you did something bad to deserve it. Can you imagine going through the loss of a child and then people looking at you like you did something wrong? She had a brain tumor, okay? No one put it there. This is a symptom of the fallen nature of a sin-stricken world, a world that God is making new, according to his Bible. But from the outside looking in, if you are evaluated on a system of karma, on a system of justice worship in the, in the ancient goddess sense, then not only do you lose your child, but then you have to face the scrutiny of the community too. This is a pagan teaching, and the enemy's hands are all over it. I encourage you to reject this teaching if you try to incorporate some of it into your worldview. You're going to find it utterly incongruous with a gospel-based understanding of why bad things happen to quote-unquote good people. This was how the inhabitants viewed Paul. Obviously, this man is a murderer. Write him off. Something bad happened to him. Now, imagine being the poor kid who gets bitten by a snake on that island. This poor kid gets bitten by a snake, and his mom's like, well, I raised a murderer, evidently. It's, a, it's not a functional worldview, but look at Paul's observation of the exact same instance. Shake it off into the fire and then goes right back to work. Jesse, but what about taking a minute to just stop and to heal? I get that. I get that. There is a time to stop. There's a time to heal. There's a time for rest, especially if you bake it into your weekly rhythm wherein you just have time, you have Sabbath rest time. If you're working at a level that you could sustain for the long haul indefinitely without burning out, praise God for that. That's even better. But Jesse, what about just taking a minute to let yourself feel the pain that you feel and then endure and then move on and then get right back on work? Here's what I encourage you to do. Take the time that you need, but don't be dragged into the temptation to just sit perpetually on the sidelines. Because for me and my experience, having also, along with my bride, lost a child too, you know what the greatest healing I ever experienced was? And this is why I think some of my critics don't understand why I went right back into ministry after all of it. Do you know where the greatest source of healing after my son's death came from was? It was telling his story and seeing people saved. And then as they would come to the altar, they would give their lives to Christ. I would see this and then I, would, then I would know why my son died. And I would find healing, some modicum of healing for the unhealable wound on a parent's heart. I would see why. I would look at the fruit that God bore through it and then I would know why. Then it would redeem the pain. Then the story would have a happy ending. Then I would see God use it to do something beautiful. The greatest healing I've experienced from the snake bites in this life come from the mission of God and the fruit that he bears through it. So excuse me if I don't want to join in the perpetual pity party because the, the, the enemy has used that to sideline effective Christians. And all around us, within a one-mile radius of us, statistically speaking, somebody's dying and going to hell. And here we sit with the gospel, sulking, feeling sorry for ourselves, attracting further attention for the wounds that we've been dealt, as though we're shocked by them. Rather, there's healing in the mission. Shake it off, get back to work, watch God move, and then find healing for your heart. The greatest healing I found for my personal grief was in the mission of God. We started the Aiden's Hope Conference. 
And we saw parents who had lost children come from around the area and find healing in their souls as they then share their stories with other bereaved parents. There is healing in the mission. So shake off the snake and get right back to work. Take the time if you need it, to take a break to heal, what have you. But your greatest healing in my experience is gonna come when you get back on mission, when you get right back on mission. Now, there's something else to be said about the snake encounter. The final chapter of Mark, Mark chapter 16. You guys are gonna think I'm making this up if you've never been to the South before. This is a real thing. There are churches where the guy who's speaking will hold a highly venomous snake while he's preaching. And this is, this is not made up, this is real. It was in a Will Ferrell movie and it's pretty spot on actually. <laughs> where they're holding a venomous snake while they're preaching. And this is all, an, uh, this is all a misapplication, a misunderstanding of Mark chapter 16. This, in Mark chapter 16, we have this portion of text that isn't included in most of the ancient manuscripts of the Bible. We've seen a lot of textual variants like that here in the closing chapters of Acts. In Acts and Revelation, you're gonna see more of those little footnotes that say most ancient manuscripts or some of the oldest ancient manuscripts or not all ancient manuscripts include these words. That's because when you look at the collective text, either through the majority version or through the oldest manuscripts as authoritative version, you, you have these slight deviations between the ancient manuscripts. And when you're a Bible translator, it's incumbent upon you to include that because that might be the inspired word of God. Mark chapter 16 includes one such textual variant. And this is where it's prophesied that, that, uh, the, that, the, that God's apostles would hold venomous snakes and not be bitten. Now, Mark 16 says they won't be bitten, and now in Acts 28, he definitely is bitten, and he doesn't die. So it does, I know that that's a natural question that comes up. I think that the text that's most likely on Paul's mind is Luke 10, 17. When Jesus had sent out the 70, they were prophesied over by Jesus that they would be bitten by snakes and would not die. It's, it's like God has called his 12 disciples. Judas is replaced by Matthias. They become apostles. And then in his epistles, Paul would describe himself as another apostle, apostle who's been born at a weird time. He's like the 13th apostle and he is sent out too. So like the 70 whom Jesus sent out in Luke chapter 10, Paul is also one who is sent out. And for that reason, he's immune. And so it's possible that the text doesn't describe what Paul was thinking at that moment, but he definitely shakes the venomous snake off and gets right back to work. So he didn't anticipate that he would die. Moreover, Paul already knew, wait, I'm going to stand before Caesar. He shakes it off into the fire and gets back to work. God has already decreed, you're going to stand before Caesar. This is how God brings him before Caesar. Now look at the confirmation bias within the observation of the worshipers of justice. So they expect him to drop dead in verse six. They wait a long time. <laughs> Imagine what that was like. What kind of snacks do you eat when you're waiting for someone to die? They're waiting for him to just drop dead and then nothing at all happens to him. So they changed their minds and they said that he was a God. That's a pretty big quantum leap. So it's, it's like they have a sense of confirmation bias within their worldview. He gets bitten by a snake and they're like, ah, that's proof of the goddess justice. And then he doesn't die like, ah, that's proof that he's a God. But Jesse, are Christians subject to committing confirmation bias too? Confirmation bias means no matter what it is, it's gonna enforce my worldview. Whether it's proof positive of a prediction that's made or even if the prediction goes awry, no matter what it is, it's gonna just prove, it's gonna further entrench me and what I believe. It doesn't matter what facts you bring at me, I'm just going to hunker down all the more in what I believe. Anybody who's been on social media in the last year knows exactly what I'm talking about. I'm just gonna get further entrenched in, the, in what I already believe. This is confirmation bias. Compare the Christian worldview and compare this worship of justice, this pagan worldview that's at work in, in Acts chapter 28. Within the Christian worldview, in my own personal experience, my own personal testimony, I've experienced God do I, I achieve miraculous triumphs. I've seen people delivered, I've seen people healed, I've seen people saved. 
It's been awesome to behold. I've also undergone tremendous pain and I've failed. And I've also seen tragedy happen in my life. But in all of these, the Christian worldview is cohesive. It's coherent. And I have an interpretive lens through which to rightly understand anything that happens to me, whether it is tragic or triumphant. This is not confirmation bias. It's just the comprehensive nature of this book. Christians will sometimes come under fire by, uh, by, by, by skeptics for saying, why don't you ever answer, I don't know? If I genuinely don't know the answer to the question, I'll, I'll say, I don't know. But it's just that if, you under, if you've gone through the whole counsel of God, there are very few questions that you're ever really left in a total quandary over. You have at least the interpretive bases to deal with virtually every problem that comes your way. And this is not, this is not Christian braggadocio. This is not you condescending to others. It's just that God's that awesome. And his word is inspired. And, and when this becomes the authoritative basis for your worldview, you're, you're left equipped for anything. Like this was good enough for the persecuted church in Rome in AD 64. It was good enough for the Christians persecuted by the Ottoman Empire. It was good enough for the Christians that the Byzantine Empire tried to eradicate. It was good enough for the Christians whom the Takogawa Shogokan tried to assassinate. Like it's, it's good enough for me. It, 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 it just works. That's not me bragging on that. If I'm bragging at all, I'm just bragging on how awesome God is and how perfect his word is. But within the, within the worship of justice, their confirmation bias takes a quantum leap forward. Either this guy who just got bitten by this snake has done something terrible, and now he's obviously a murderer and he's going to suffer for it, or he is himself a part of that deity. He has himself just received a huge promotion from murderer to God. You can see the quantum leap that they take because their confirmation bias forces them to do it. Watch for confirmation bias and understand how to distinguish it from your own Christian worldview. As Christians, we can look at the book of Job and we can rightly understand why bad things happen. We see behind the scenes as to why it takes place. We know who gets the glory when awesome things happen. As Christians, we know where we came from. We know what the morality is real. We know where it's going. And we know that in the end, the good guy wins. We're able to answer these questions, and that's not because we're smarter than everybody else. Good grief, no. It's because he's just so good. But without this, confirmation bias is particularly prone. So be ready and be prepared to answer an accusation of confirmation bias because you'll have answers to questions that they don't have. And unfairly, they'll criticize you for being able to answer questions. That's, that, seems, that seems really unfair to me. Like, because I have an answer to your question, I'm, I'm disqualified from the discussion. That seems directly counterintuitive. But be prepared for this. You as a Christian may be accused of confirmation bias. The truth is, God's word is complete. Now, they take a quantum leap. They radically change their minds. They now have decided that Paul is a God. That will affect how they interpret what comes next. Let's finish the text. Now in the area around that place was an estate belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us hospitably for three days. Pause right there. 276 people hosted for three days. That is hospitality indeed. They're on an annexed island that's, that's a part of this, this whole region. All these islands in this region are under, the, under the, uh, the authority of the Roman Empire. And so they have this guy who is sort of like hosting their garrison on the island. But Publius has his own story. Look at verse 8. His father was in bed suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to him, praying, laying his hands on him, and healed him. After this, the rest of those in the island who had diseases also came and were healed. So they heaped many honors on us when we sailed and they gave us what we needed. And now your curriculum is going to pick up from here. And you're going to see Paul go to Rome at last. He's greeted by more believers. He's going to meet with some of the Jewish authorities while he's in Rome. And this is where he'll remain in prison until he stands before Nero one day. And in the very closing of the book, Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house, and he welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This is the backdrop for the authorship of the prison epistles. But back to, back to Malta, the island before he arrives at Rome. This guy who is the representative of the Roman authority has a father who's sick. 
on Malta, they had their own sickness. They nicknamed it Malta fever because if you were to drink goat's milk that was impure, you would suffer from exactly the symptoms that are described here. But Paul goes, prays, lays his hands on him, and he's healed, verse eight. And then what happens next? After this, the rest of the island who had diseases all came and were healed. But it began with the father of the leader of the church. Tradition, historic tradition maintains that a church was planted even in these few days on Malta, and Publius himself would be the one who leads that church. I, I can't back that up scripturally, but historic tradition maintains that somebody, possibly this guy, would lead the church in Malta. And it would start with leadership. God would heal the leader, and then from there, the rest of the island would experience healing. Do you see? It's funny how that works, isn't it? When it starts with leadership, and then everything else falls into place. This story is one of incredible grit. Look at everything that Paul has been through. When we study 1 Corinthians, you'll see that it's even worse than it looks right now in Acts. We've seen Paul arrested. We've seen Paul publicly beaten. We've seen Paul miraculously delivered from prison and put back into prison. We've seen Paul stoned nearly to death. They thought that he was dead and they all go inside. And then Paul gets back up and goes back into that city to spend one more night before, you guessed it, getting back on the road and going for it again. We've seen Paul accused of horrific things. In today's text, he's accused of being a murderer because a snake bit him. Oh, by the way, a snake bit him. Like, this is bad stuff. Paul has been through brutality. But in 1 Corinthians, you're going to see his own take on all of it. This is grit. And it's something that's largely lost on Christians today. I taught us the book of John because I want you to know exactly what to share with people who are far from God. I've gone through the book of Acts because I want you to see what your God is capable of. And in the closing of our sermon in Acts, I want you to see what kind of grit it takes to watch God move mightily and bring revival. I think that one indicator of success in all endeavors, both spiritual and professional, is one's willingness to endure pain. A willingness to endure. There are some sermons that have soaring, healing, inspirational motifs to them that make you limp into the church and then gallop out of the church. And there are some sermons that are so uplifting, they cause your heart to soar. This is not one of those sermons. This is, however, exactly what the Christians of Seattle need to hear. Because with this godly perseverance, God produces maturity in us. Through these trials, we find reason for incredible joy. With grit like Paul's and a willingness to withstand wrongful treatment and mis misrepresentation and public insults and smear campaigns and humiliation on social media and at the hands of bloggers and a misrepresentation, even while standing in a park in downtown Seattle, like serving the homeless and, per and having to say, excuse me to the news camera there who's slandering the whole operation while not doing anything to help. Like th th this is the kind of grit that it takes for Christians to see God move mightily, are you prepared to endure any modicum of emotional pain, Christian? Are you prepared to endure the snake bites? Are you prepared to endure the shipwrecks? Are you prepared to endure? This is what it takes, but look at what God does. This is the kind of Christian grit that God will use mightily. Now I want to close by talking to my, my skeptical friend who's joined us today. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're with us. It may not have occurred to you that life can be difficult for Christians because of our Christianity, especially in an increasingly anti-Christian culture. This is how the gospel got here because it's from Malta that Paul would go to Rome. He's already planted the church in Macedonia that would become Europe, that would colonize the U.S., that would spread Christianity as far west as, you know, Seattle. <laughs> so we can trace our lineage back to the events of this book. 
As Acts 16 unfolded, the gospel entered Europe. As it entered Europe, it was cradled in the Catholic Church, which split, became the Church of England, which gave rise to the Puritans who wanted to practice Christianity freely, freely and uh, freely and purely without intervention from the state. And then they colonized the New World. The New World declares its independence. It moves westward to include Washington. And now the Redemption Church is one of the newest churches in Washington State. But its tradition goes back to these very words in the book of Acts. This story of the gospel that has arrived here is not new. It is of ancient. And it has been in the works for a long time by a sovereign God who loves you. You may have come in under the same kind of oppression of karma, of justice. The same, the same initial judgment that the people on Malta initially cast upon Paul and said, this guy is obviously a murderer. He's obviously done something terribly wrong. If you came in under that same false pagan teaching and you suffered loss, you lost a loved one to cancer, you lost a loved one to a car wreck, you've been bitten by the snake of this world in some form or another, and you've been bearing guilt on your own soul that was placed there by a pagan teaching, and the name of Jesus Christ proclaim you free today. By the power of his Holy Spirit, would you be set free from that false teaching today? Would you, to the glory of God, shake it off? Would you come running to Jesus? Would you give your life to him and find healing and find purpose and find redemption for the snake bites? Find redemption in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll ask if you would stand with me as we close. We're going to close out. We're going to worship God together. And as we're here, as we're worshiping, there's going to be people here at the very front who are ready to pray with you for absolutely anything that you need. If you're a Christian who's been called of God to just exercise Christian grit, to buck up and endure pain and trial like a godly Christian, would you come forward and find the courage to do that? If you have someone in your life you're ready to share the gospel with, you come forward and pray for that. If you've just been hurting and you just need healing, would you come forward and pray for that? If you are looking for community, you feel all alone in this world, would would you come forward and pray for that? And then would you meet Pastor Mike in the back and sign up for a small group? Would you, if you are my skeptical friend, pray with me right now? And if you need to be baptized to the glory of God, take out your smartphone and check the second box on the connect card. Let's go before God. God, this gospel arrived here on these shores at great cost. And in the midst of tremendous suffering on the part of people who love you, God, I believe it all. I believe that it's true. I'm the latest installment in the event of the book of Acts. I believe, Jesus, that you are the Son of God. I confess that I've sinned and I've fallen short of the glory of God. I confess, I, I admit it right here and now. I have sinned and the consequences for my sin is death. But the gift that you offer, oh God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I believe that, Jesus, you're the only way. There's nobody else who went to the cross. There's nobody else who resurrected. There's nobody else who took upon himself the cause for my sin. I don't suffer consequences for my sin or past lives, sins. I don't suffer because I've done wrong. I suffer, oh God, in a sin-stricken world. I can be redeemed. I can be set free. I don't have to suffer the eternal consequences of my sin. I can be set free by the power of Jesus and Jesus alone. I believe you, Jesus. I believe that you are the way that I can be set free from the consequences of my sin. Not held to karma, not held to the worship of justice. That you are the truth. That you are the life. And there's no way I can be redeemed except through you, Jesus. So right here and now, drawn by the Holy Spirit of God, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Redemption Church, would you say Jesus is Lord? Say it, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now God, let me be saved. Let me be saved. Let me be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.